After a special public screening of the Central Park Five, KTTZ conducted a town hall discussion panel to examine the issues and topics raised by the film. We hope this discussion is an enlightening one that will lead our viewers to a better understanding of the issues we face in our country, but more importantly, the issues we face in our community and how we can overcome them. Good evening, and I want to thank you all for being here at the screening of Ken Burns' provocative and powerful new documentary, The Central Park Five. Um, my name is Alisa Wong. I am an associate chair and associate professor in the Department of History at Texas Tech University, and it is my great pleasure to be your host this evening. Um, as you've all seen, Ken Burns has produced an incredibly insightful new inquiry into the Central Park Five, into the Central Park rape case, and into the aftermath of what that case meant for African Americans, for New York City citizens, um, but also for the United States in general and for the ways in which we envision race, the ways we envision justice, and the ways in which we envision redemption. So we are very fortunate today to have four distinguished panelists with us to discuss the film, to discuss the case, and to discuss their own thoughts on the way in which the Central Park case changes um, the ways in which we as um, Americans, we as Texans, um, and we as global humans, global citizens, have to become aware of our surroundings, aware of our prejudices, aware of the stereotypes, um, and aware of the constructions that we are constantly making day in and day out. Uh, first, we have Dr. Paul Frazier, who after 23 years with LISD as principal of Estacado High School and as the executive director for um, student uh, outreach, um, has now joined Texas Tech University as assistant vice president in the division of institutional diversity, equity, and um, community engagement. We have Dr. Carlos Hill, an assistant professor in the Department of History, whose expertise is in the history of lynching and racial violence in the United States. And his book, which reframes the meaning and the significance of the lynched black body, is currently under contract with Cambridge University Press. We have Dr. Hans Hansen, who is an associate professor of management, an Embry Human Rights Fellow at Southern Methodist University and the director of the Center for Innovative Organizations. His work on death penalty has changed the ways in which death penalty defenses have operated in the state of Texas. And last but not least, we have Mr. Wade Jackson, who joined the Lubbock County District Attorney's Office in 1995, and since 2008 has served as first assistant for the Lubbock County Criminal District Attorney's Office in the state of Texas. Welcome all. The first question I'd like to throw out to the panel is really to tell, tell us your thoughts about how this could possibly happen. What it is about New York City, what it is about the 1980s, what it is about you know, th th this time in American history that allows for one, um, the, the, the public to, to become so fascinated and so mired in the politics and the power of this case, but two, allows for a kind of public pressure for the prosecution of these youths. If, if I may go first, I, I immediately reflected back on uh, my high school days. Um, I, I was just 21 in, in 89. Uh, I thought back about uh, some of the individuals I, I grew up with. Some of those individuals are no longer here. Um, I thought about some of the things we did as, as teenagers in just wrong place, wrong time, that that could have easily been uh, myself or, or others that I, that I was with. Absolutely. Um, that's one of the first uh, reactions that I had to the film, which is I, was, I wasn't 21 in 1989. I was nine years old. Um, Yo, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I rub thought... Rub it in. Rub yeah, it in. No, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. But nonetheless, I thought if I would have been in Central Park in 1989, I could have easily been uh, a part of that dragnet. Um, but to answer your question directly, um, I think there was a lot going on in the 1980s in America. Uh, most significantly was the war on drugs and then the beginnings of mass incarceration in 1980. Um, the prison population in America was a roughly about 300,000. In 2013, it's 2.3 million um, Americans in prison, mostly for drug charges, minor drug charges. Um, and so of that 2.3 million, 40% of those are the poor and people of color. And so 
this story of mass incarceration and that ma story of mass incarceration that fed into the drug war really begins in, in, in the early 1980s. And so Corey Rice, uh, Yusef Salam, Kevin Richardson, they were all a part of this larger story. And Ken Burns does a great job of sort of, 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 of framing it around that, but he doesn't go into detail because he only has two hours. But that's the larger, um, I think, the larger con historical context in which this occurs. And so now we're living through, right, we're living through um, the decisions that were made in the 1980s about maximum sentence prisons uh, for, for even minor drug choices. And so this case is sort of, as you said before, a microcosm. <coughs> Uh, of what was happening in the 1980s. Okay. Well, of course, I thought, I mean, I suppose like our audience here, uh, my first thoughts were how could this happen and what a tragedy it, what a tragedy it is, and I was also enraged. Uh, but my thoughts also came to Lubbock, Texas. Uh, not 1989, but 1984, because uh, I don't want us to think that this can only happen in some faraway place, that a case worse than this happened right here in Lubbock, Texas. So if you can't believe that something would like this occur in, in New York City, uh, it occurred here in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, there, was a, a tex there was a series of rapes uh, on Texas Tech's campus, and the suspect was black, and a white plainclothes police officer uh, walked across the campus as bait for the suspect, and uh, a gentleman named Timothy Cole was a black student at Texas Tech who approached the white police officer. And because he approached her uh, to talk to her, to ask for her phone number, he became the lead suspect as a serial rapist. He was convicted. The difference between this case is that he always maintained his innocence. Uh, and he died in prison. Uh, he had asthma. And in 1999, he died in prison. Uh, and he never got justice. So if, if this enraged you about New York City, the, the people of Lubbock, we, we did the same thing but worse in 1984. Mr. Jackson, I don't know if you're familiar with that case, um, being with the district attorney's office. Um, from, from the research that, that I did on the case, um, I believe it was in 1985, it, he was, um, Timothy Cole was a, a uh, African-American Texas Tech student. He was also a war veteran. He'd come back to finish his last two years. And there were a series of missteps um, that, that led to his capture, his conviction. Um, but later he was, despite the fact that he died in prison, later he was exonerated and he was given a pardon by Rick Perry. There were a number of bureaucracies that went through that. Can, can you speak a little to, to that case? Uh, that is a tragic case. I'm not in any way trying to defend an innocent person who uh, spent their life in, in prison and then died in prison. Uh, there was a misidentification. Uh, the, uh, uh, at one point, the real perpetrator confessed after the statute of limitations ran out. Uh, even though uh, my boss and I were in college and we weren't anywhere near, the, uh, my boss uh, requested two of his investigators to go and talk to the real perpetrator. He got their D, his, that real perpetrator's DNA and uh, ran the test and found out that Timothy Cole was, was totally innocent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Rick Perry, I believe, pardoned Timothy Cole in 2010, a posthumous pardon. And there is now legislation, I think, going through the state talking about what the state of Texas can do with wrongful convictions, uh, um, compensation, college right. degree, uh, college uh, During the last legislative session, there was uh, when a crime, I mean, a, a prisoner has been exonerated, they upped the compensation level, uh, they uh, changed some of the identification procedures and passed some legislation along those way, along those lines. Another person who was innocent and was convicted, uh, Michael Morton out of Georgetown, uh, and there will be some more legislation that they're talking about this legislative session. I think that one of the things that this documentary shows us is that we live very much with this in our skin, um, and that the, the very end of the film, um, when they're talking about the fact that they have lost things, despite the fact that they're free men, despite the fact that they've been cleared, they've been taken off the sex offenders list, life returning to normalcy, there's, there's no, more, no longer any possibility of normalcy for them. You, you know, unfortunately, uh, a, a number of times, we, we sacrifice uh, students and, and, and children 
uh, for adult convenience. And, and I think this is, uh, this case, this uh, the story uh, of the Central Park Five uh, emulates that. <clears throat> I, I see that quite often in our public school setting. Uh, we, we, we often look and, and make prey of uh, the areas of least of the least resistance, and and uh, you know we, we personify that on a daily basis. So I think that that you have some uh, systemic and, and uh, racism that takes place on a daily basis. Um, and, and if you call individuals on those things, uh, they oftentimes will say, "Well, no, that, that's not the issue." Um, and then we'll look at the political side of it and say, "Well, I, I did it because." this set of individual may be upset or uh, it may cause a situation in, in another sphere. Um, so I, I think that's the travesty that, that happens not only in, in the justice system, I think it have, happens in our uh, educational system as well. I mean, you, you speak from a very unique position as yes. principal of Estacado High School, right? And, and it's a high school that, that I think has um, made tremendous leaps and bounds um, to provide for their students. Um, but it's also a unique population, I think. I think it's a population that oftentimes in Lubbock, we don't, we don't speak of the, the kind of segregation that happens, the kind of divide that happens. You, you know, to, to that, I, I would say um, that, that I, I love Estacada High School, uh, even though I, I worked for Central Law, because it reminded me so much of the high school I attended uh, in Amarillo. But, but I will say to that that uh, our city has grown. Uh, and so we have some diversity all over. Each one of our campuses uh, ha have a number of minority students that they didn't have before. Uh, I can remember when I coached at uh, Monterey High School, uh, it was a predominantly Anglo uh, population. Uh, now it's a predominantly Hispanic population. So I think we gotta look at the dynamics of the city has changed. Right. Uh, and, but I don't think uh, uh, some of the individuals in those pockets have changed. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, this film, the way in which it depicts the scenario that led to the convictions of those five young, young men, is eerily similar to what would have happened in the Jim Crow South in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s. Um, and in many ways, when I, when I suggest that, I'm suggesting that they saw it as a war zone. Right? New York City Central Park was under attack, and because it was under attack, they needed to, as quickly as possible, circle the wagons, find who was guilty of this crime, put them in jail so that everyone could go back, so that life could go back to normal. But even beyond that, um, there was a sense that not only was there New York City Central Park a war zone, the manhood of the criminal justice system was at stake. And in order to restore that, right, there needed to be aggressive, forceful, um, and in many ways, um, intense action taken against those who were, were guilty. And so that kind of mentality led to 5,000 African-American men, mostly men, but also women, being lynched in the United States between 1880 and 1960. And so it's eerily similar to the kind of mentality, right, this war zone, right, the manhood of New York City is at stake, we need to restore it, is what led to uh, many lynchings in the past, but um, I would say what's most tragic about the Central Park case um, is that it occurred to children. I mean, I think that that's, that's a, an apt description, and, and given your work, um, Dr. Hansen actually uh, created a course called Human Rights in the Corporation, um, which is one of the first cor uh, courses of its kind, talking about you know human rights, the corporation, but also institutionalized racism, the ways in which these things become part of the system. Yeah, and I would say I am familiar with and can speak to the pressures within ju in the justice system, and the setting in New York illustrates that, but it happens in the justice system at every level in the country. There is a pressure not to find the truth, which justice is about, but to get convictions. And so under that pressure, uh, exemplified in this movie was the, the pressure to get a confession, for example. So the police love confessions uh, because it handles all their police work. It's really tough to build a case, but if you can get a confession instead, a lot of that work, uh, it becomes much easier. And j just like the jurors, the juror mentioned in the movie, that 
and the, the reporter that once you, gave, once you get a confession, that overrides DNA, eyewitness testimony, almost anything if someone is willing to confess to a crime. Uh, I would say also that uh, false confessions do occur, um, but they're probably, and, and innocence occurs in the justice system, but uh, it is exceedingly rare. Uh, true claims of innocence are rare, but they do occur. So I think if uh, it becomes very difficult to kind of counteract the institutional pressures to find convictions instead of find the truth, which the justice system should do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson, from your experience in, in the district attorney's office, I mean, you are, you are basically in the trenches, right? And you are the one who's feeling, I mean, all of these kind of myriad pressures at the same time. You have the political pressures, you have kind of the public pressures. Media has added another element to that. And I think that one of the things that, um, that we often forget is that we are, that, that, that the district attorneys, the police, the, the um, legal um, counsel are, are also human beings. Right, and you, you, there are pressures that you, you definitely feel. Can you speak a little bit to, to, to that? Uh, Lubbock has some fairly high profile cases. I, I can't guess which one it's gonna be. It, it seems like it's a case that strikes a chord, uh, be it a place like at South Plains Mall, or be it the, the victim, uh, 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 if the victim, uh, animal cruelty strikes a huge chord mm -hmm. uh, throughout uh, our, uh, County and across the nation, uh, it seems to be what strikes a chord in in the population. Uh, and, and as far and I, I do want to talk about Texas a little bit and juvenile confessions. There at least is some protection. Uh, they are required the if the police take a confession from a juvenile that's that's someone who's committed a crime before they're 17 here in Texas. They're required to take them before a magistrate, a neutral magistrate who will give them their rights and then uh, outside the presence of the police officer and if they sign that statement, that will be in the presence of the magistrate outside the presence of the police officer. I would like to open this up to our audience members and invite any of you who might have questions or comments um, either for the panel or, or just for yourselves to come down to the microphone and, and we would love to hear your thoughts. Good evening, thank you all for being here. I'm a lawyer, I watch TV, and I see many shows showing prosecutors doing investigations. I'd like to know, and, and I believe that um, what we see on TV eventually becomes reality. I'm hoping that prosecutors are not investigators, but I'd like to ask um, Mr. Jackson, if, if that's happening in our DA's office, and then for the rest of you to say if you think that would be good or, or not good. We do not investigate crimes. We get cr crimes reported to us uh, by law enforcement agencies, and we act upon what uh, the written reports say. I mean, they're, they're involved in the same th in case resolution, so I, I wish it were as cut and dry as described, but at, of course, prosecutors have to put a story together, so at some point, they are at least making sense of events, so at some point, they have to take the role of investigator, if they're going to understand investigative reports or to prosecute a case, so we're th I'm, not, I'm not so concerned that it's a, a problem. They shouldn't be investigators as prosecutors, but the lines bleed. It's, the justice system is not, uh, d despite the procedural uh, code we have in place, it's still a messy process and there's lots of room for mistake and it's, there are many gray areas. Next question, please. Good evening, panelists, and thank you for your time. My name is Tim Day. I'm a local uh, film critic, film blogger. There are striking similarities in the Central Park Five case in this documentary with a documentary that appeared this last year west of Memphis with the West Memphis Three uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Miss Kelly, uh, Jason Baldwin, Damian Eccles all being in prison for 18 years and actually in the rare Alford uh, statements sort of their, uh, their convictions uh, pleading guilty only to be released from prison. And uh, it also is a community that is outraged in the Central Park Five case fueled by race 
and in the West Memphis Three, fueled by fears of satanic ritual in a rural setting. And so uh, we've touched on it just uh, briefly uh, tonight, but maybe your thoughts about the media influence and the media fueling uh, part of the public opinions in regards to these uh, children, uh, both, both in West Memphis, Arkansas, as, as well as here in Central Park, uh, and these uh, filmmakers spotlighting these children that have put in prison and uh, the press uh, and the part that they have to play. Thank you. You, you know, I, th I think we live in an age that is, that is driven by social media. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, most times we repeat the, the, the negative stories rather than the, the feel-good stories, uh, uh, you know, Social media and, and formerly newspapers or magazines thrived on producing the negative side of stories. I would say that uh, racial representations um, die a slow death. And then they are reborn with a vengeance. And so I think you see that in the Central Park Five case. Um, instead of calling them black beasts, rapists, as they would have been called during the Jim Crow South, um, they were called a wolf pack, right? And so you have a situation where an eight or a hundred years discourse about black men as rapists is repurposed um, to fit within sort of uh, the new racial discourse in America coming out of the civil rights movement where you couldn't use uh, explicitly racialized terms such as a black beast rapist, but you could use the term wilding, you could use the term wolf pack. And so that's an example of how a, a very um, powerful racial discourse was repurposed for the 1980s, or for the purpose of the 1980s discourse after the civil rights movement, but in order to say the very same thing, right? And so um, I, I guess what I would say is that it does, when it bleeds, it does lead uh, it does lead, but in many cases, it leads when it's a age-old racial representation that people are familiar with, people understand the narrative that's impl implicated in that, in those representations, and in many ways, that led to the feeding frenzy and the push to get the convic convictions because society already knew that they were guilty because the narrative of the black beast rapist um, told them so in many cases. And so um, that would be, um, I think, a, a one way to frame why there was a rush within the media to convict them even before the trial had occurred. Next question, please. I didn't have a question. I had comments. And, and I guess I want to feed off of what uh, you just said. The uh, prosecution being pressured, however, pushing forward to get a conviction with the Timothy Cole case, with the the Central Park Five case. Um, somehow or another, we've got to figure out as a society how we break that chain. Um, we, I think, have to do a better job of socializing our youth. And I happen to be a counselor in the Lubbock Independent School District. I think we have to do a better job of socializing our youth um, on how to use the criminal justice system. In other words, when you're arrested, you do not talk unless you have legal representation. Oftentimes, unfortunately, people don't have access to legal representation. And uh, there are some private ways um, that you can get access. We know about the uh, public defender's office. I don't know we can trust the public defender's office to do and make the best representation for uh, low-income individuals um, and maybe even middle-class individuals. Um, and maybe Mr. Jackson might want to speak to that. Um, but again, access to legal representation, I think, is the big takeaway from this. Uh, another comment I wanted to make was, I didn't realize that these Central Park Five guys had been exonerated. I clearly remember when this case occurred and feeling how heinous a crime this was. And so I'm so thankful for Ken Burns and McMahon and uh, Sarah Burns for making this so we can have this as a, a talking point for uh, future discussions. That's another part that, en that encourages us to repeat these patterns is that when you get a conviction, it makes the front page. When there's an exoneration, it makes the back page. And I think there was actually more play about Ken Burns beating the the, um, subi the subpoena 
um, request than, than there was actually about the exoneration of, of, of the Central Park Five. Mr. Jackson, did you have a comment on, on the legal defense? If you wanted me to talk to the, about the public defender's office, sure. I, I'm sorry, I, uh, I'm on one side, they're on the other, and the judge is in the, the middle, and that's not appropriate for me to comment on, on their office. Thank you very much for your questions. I'd like to ask the panelists to make some final remarks, um, uh, summing up kind of our evening's events. <clears throat> First, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a panelist. Uh, in, in 1989, I, I had no clue of those things, you know, because I was all in my small little world. And I, I think oftentimes we just stay in our small little world and, and don't realize some, some of the things that are impacting our lives, uh, even though they may be far off. Uh, I think there's ways to, to that we can address uh, self-efficacy uh, in some of our young African American males, uh, because if you say um, that I'm powerful and I'm a lawyer and I'm a doctor, then that's what I strive to be. But if you say that I'm a thug and I'm a hoodlum, <laughs> that is what I become. And I was also add to that that it's not simply the responsibility of a district attorney or the police to protect it and serve. It's the responsibility for citizens to do that as well and to force the criminal justice system to protect and serve. And so um, it, watching this film, it would be easy to convict or it would be easy to, to pass blame on to the criminal justice system. That's not the answer. It's that in New York City, the citizens of New York City, black, white, brown, and whatever, should have at that time demanded justice for those Central Park Five. And so those are the questions, right? Why didn't justice happen? Um, those are the questions that we need to continue to ask um, in the wake of this, I think in the wake of this film. I think it's, the film was good art and art does something that uh, asks us to reflect upon ourselves. So when we see art like this, we know that that's us. And it's especially poignant in Lubbock because this was us. Uh, in the mid 80s, this, the, it mirrors lots that happened here. And it's also intertwined with our future. The only danger is if we have an opportunity to reflect and do not look because we don't like what we see. So we have to kind of contend with what we see. And the stakes could not be higher, especially here in Texas, because uh, the question of innocence, while, while I say is extremely rare, uh, is an occurrence that we need to reflect on and we have not dealt with it. Uh, on Texas's death row, there have been 12 exonerations. That means that someone was scheduled to die who was later found to be innocent. Uh, and given those 12 exonerations, there is a certainty that someone who should have been exonerated has been put to death in Texas. And there's a law review paper uh, out that shows that Texas has executed an innocent. Uh, so I think the need for reflection uh, is really significant and meaningful, and the stakes has never been higher, and the, the, it's on us now to use this art to help us reflect upon ourselves, and the only uh, crime we can commit is to refuse to do so. Mr. Jackson? I, I just, I can't overemphasize. I, I, it does not bring me joy that five innocent people serve penitentiary time. I, I want to find out why that happened and so it doesn't happen again. It is a very complex question. Uh, I think uh, we'll be dealing with that. I do think as uh, these exonerations come up, I think the DA's offices are looking harder. I think the police are looking harder at, uh, at the way they do things, the, uh, the way they take interviews, the way they identify suspects, and that is being done currently, and I hope that this doesn't happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this special presentation of Ken Burns, the Central Park Five, and KTTZ's Town Hall Discussion Panel. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at the address on your screen. Thank you, and have a good night.